chapter one. Heat hung fierce for, for spring over the town of Greenboro, Mississippi. The late sunlight flickering in dusty rays, a breeze that might have otherwise refreshed only added to the oppressive atmosphere. Diving in the gusts to trouble the crindo lined skirts of the ladies among the boardwalk. Except for a few accompanied by personal slaves, the women struggled with their parcels as they clutched their bonnets close against a tray. Haze of dust unfurled in the wake of passing to carts nailed to the library stable. A serv- stable, to notice, snapped in the gritty air. A sound of two women halted on the boardwalk. Ellie Matthews pressed a gloved finger to steal the paper. A cluster of men nearby suspended a conversation to stare, and all of them, them, Emily jerked away from Ginny's restraining grip and tore the poster from its nail. You just chop that thing, Mrs. Emily. Here, give it to me. Fierce determination drove Ginny's half whisper. Leave, leave it be, Ginny. Emily, Emily thrust the paper in the crumpled holes deep into her pockets. Papa I must see this. Harmony Cleverly is selling leave them. People are watching you, Mrs. Emily. Leave it now. You're going to get someone killed. Emily shook herself free of Jenny's. Grabbed at her hoops and stepped down into the dirt of the street. In spite of a sudden glances of direction, Emily shouldered through the dwindling afternoon crowd and negated her way through the fine buggies, prodding wheels and clattering wagons, and even ever-present dung on Main Street. Ginny funneled behind her, eyes down but missing nothing, opposite the courthouse. Emily glanced at the edge of the grey bonnet, squinting. She banished the crumpled paper up to her father, who, where he, he watched from, uh, watched for her from his office, as he did every Friday. His hair and beard glowed white in a sunlight window. His eyes intense under the thick brows. He saw me, and he thought. She stepped out in the courthouse, snorn. A time two women mounted the steps. Judge Matthews was looking, locking the heavy front doors. One arm locked, loaded with law box. Emily strained herself, but barely. He ducked under her bonnet to kiss her cheek and smooth a loose strayed of hair over her ear. She smiled and nodded to Jenny. Emily thrust his nose at him. This is a travesty, Pa. You must do something. Those anti slavery starts took a heavy toll on him, both in the town like Greensboro. She counted on the foundation. He shook the rumble paper flat, and Jenny clutched the unstable law box as Emily peered over her father's sleeve, a hand fisted against his arm. He was three, three receptacles from a pocket, flickered them open. Picked on them and adjusted them on his nose, where he magnified the intensity of his almost brown eyes. To be sold and let by public auction on Monday, 7th of March, 1859. For sale, the following three slaves, Nathan, a 30-year-old buck, an excellent hand of God, character with some training as a household servant. He got no further as only jabbed the words. Nathan's had a wife and two children. She said, I'll see them when I call on Virginia. Coker's going to tear the family apart. He cares nothing for the family, including his own. He's a despicable man. Pa and cruel, she glanced at Gray. Victoria never speaks of it, but she I see her bruises, and one she doesn't cover more than all her life counts for. Judge Matthews folded and noticed a treaty box. Thank you, Jenny. The judge knew cold and well, an unwelcome, perhaps even dangerous, cold of his son, Jeremiah. Silence had never to developed to free as he jolted and rutted road home. First father, then daughter, commenced to speak, but stopped at their utterance complete. He's a vow man, Pa, and he said, as he, he, as he helped her for the buggy. Evil was the word he wanted. She wanted to use. Can you stop him? He hefted the Lord books for the wagon and held it down to Jenny. I do what I can. Jessie pulled the ripped dress through her frail torso and shivered. Morning was a more 
and moving towards the horizon, she stood on an unpainted porch, her eyes blank, not seeing a children's red ball in the dusty yard, a pile of rocks she hauled up from the creek yesterday to lie in the front walkway, nor the broom that abandoned her in panic. Jessie did not see her own shoe, the sagging step caught there as she fled over to Cochrane. Her dark eyes saw nothing before her, her mind seeing only what had befallen her, her cabin behind, her white, heavy white hands, her freckled like dirty snow, a struggling look of reddish hair over the icy eyes that burned into her naked flesh, her own hands gripping the posts of the bed, Nathan had built from her from scrap. Today she will lose him, perhaps forever. He will never know, need to know this thing. Uh, what had happened. She spun back to the, to the cabin, the single room, closed the door, wrenched the cork sheet from the bed, and piled it on the floor. Heaving, she collapsed on the violet, violated fabric in a rough rastress. As a boy only quiet, she rose. She dropped, stripped off the torn dress, dripped the bearish edge into the water bucket by the door, and wiped the blood from her legs. Removing her amber shift from its bag, she pulled it hard over a thin body and threw the damp remains of her dress on top of the mounted sheet. Out back she gathered an unload of fallen branches, ignoring the sharp twigs dragging into her flesh. She stacked them one by one, a blanket coals from the night before she blew into the fireplace, coughing from the dust and ashes. A flame sputtered a kindling court as a kindling court. Jessie shifted on her horses, but without relief from the pain. She held the wet edge of the ruined dress over the flame. When it was dry enough, Jessie laid it on the growling, growing fire. Her teeth, she walked toward the edge of the sheet, ripped it down its length and fled the two halves of the flames. When the fur lost the fabric caught, lost the fabric caught, Jessie stood holding the bedpost. She gazed around the cabin, blood stained the thick chicken or corn, sucked mantress, a rag and lined soap. She scrubbed the stains in narrowing circles. She took clean water, reversed the spirals, rinsed away the soap, but not the stain, not all of it. Outside, Jessie dropped the rag in the dirt and started up the lane between towards Aunt Clara's. A cluster of children towards her, her, including her own, too young for the field, played in the early dawn among around the old woman's cabin. Jessie came to the yard, and Clara shushed the boy's wells, brushed dirt, dirt from his knees. Auntie, I need your help, Jessie. Jessie looked down, a boy who stopped crying and ran. I need a bed cover.